Hi, good evening and welcome to the NYU Langone Orthopedic Webinar Series. Tonight, we're going to present to you, on, uh, to you on some really interesting innovations in spine surgery. So we're going to be discussing the latest innovations in spine surgery from non-fusion scoliosis correction to minimally invasive surgery and robotics. Um, so we have a, have a really exciting lineup tonight. Um, first, we're going to have Dr. Rodriguez Oliveri talk to you about non-fusion scoliosis surgery and that it's here to stay. Followed by Dr. Jagade, going to be talking about MIS inner body navigation. Is that a neat trick or a necessary tool? And then Dr. Probe Saltis will be discussing optimal use of robotics and navigation assistance in adult spinal deformity. And then we'll have Dr. Jeffrey Goldstein going over getting through the learning curve of robotic assisted spine surgery swiftly and safely. And then after that, I'm going to present some interesting cases and get our uh, faculty's input, and we'll go over some questions and answers. Um, so first up, we have to we have Dr. Juan uh, Rodriguez Oliveri. He's going to be discussing non-fusion scoliosis correction, and that it's here to stay. Okay. Good afternoon, everybody. Thanks so much for the invitation uh, to this uh, webinar. So today I'm going to talk a little bit about what we're doing in scoliosis uh, with non non fusion. So as you know, um, in uh, this is not new. Okay. So the standard goal gold standard for uh, scoliosis correction is uh, do a fusion. But the problem with the fusion is the spine moves. So we fuse in the spine that moves, and we have problems in the future with the innervation of the disc. Uh, we put rods who are not contouring the right way so we can have sagittal decompensation. Uh, the spine, like I told you before, is not going to move. And opposite to fusion, this technique, you always can go back to fusion. You don't close the door for that. So it's good to innovate and know that you can fix it uh, with the gold standard if you need to. Um, there are some, uh, a lot of papers when we started doing posterior spinal fusion with complications that uh, it started us to think about ways to uh, change the fusion ways uh, to a more mobile spine. And that's why we started with the uh, anterior sclerosis correction of body, better body tethering. And this is a nice picture comparing to what we do uh, with the fusion, with rods and screws going posteriorly in the spine. And with the cord, that was basically laterally. And uh, you have like a flexible cord made of uh, polyethylene and that makes the uh, quality of life better for this patient. The uh, concept is not a new concept. It's an old concept of compression in the part that uh, to stop the growing and the, uh, in the concave side, then in the convex side, you continue to grow. So that's why the FDA uh, indications are more uh, for uh, immature patients that still have a lot of growing left. So like I told you before, it's less invasive because uh, going anteriorly, you don't have a lot of muscles. You only uh, have a couple of muscles you open uh, anteriorly, like the serratus and the, uh, 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 the muscles are close to the um, ribs that you basically, you dissect them and, and open it. Uh, and then compared to the fusion that you had to open the back and take all the muscles out of the spine to make the fusion. Uh, most part is not a burn like I told you before, and you always have the opportunity to do a fusion. In comparing fusions to um, the cord, you know, the hospital stay is a little bit less. Uh, blood loss is much less. Uh, you haven't had any transfusion in patients with uh, better body tethering compared to posterior spinal fusions. So I think in a way it's, it's, it's better that uh, the, um, the gold standard. And there are some papers also comparing because of the of, of the uh, criticism about not controlling the cytoplane with the accord that they, they did. Uh, Dr. Betts did this nice paper in Journal of I Joint saying that uh, going anteriorly and compressing the anterior column, you get kyphosis, uh, and that help is uh, cervical improvement of the lower doses. In uh, China, in Philadelphia, they did a nice study comparing. Uh, fusion to tethers in, in movement, and uh, you can see the pictures of how much you can bend uh, when you have a tethering device in the spine compared to a posterior spinal fusion, and then how much you can rotate with a cord than with, uh, with a fusion. You lose like 10 degrees of rotation in the uh, spine when you do a fusion. 
Um, the indications for this, like I told you, uh, we need to have uh, immature patients, even though we I'm doing mature patients too, but we can talk that about later. Uh, so we do two classification systems to know if they're immature. One is the Sanders score, which is one to seven. So the immature are one to four, and the mature patients are five, six, seven, eight. And then uh, that this is a nice picture of how you uh, evaluate the patient and the growth plate. And the other was research staging, that is one zero to five. Uh, when there's more than two, we can see the mature because the growth spurt is already done. So those are the better indications. So research zero one, standards less than four in mature patients, uh, only in tricholumbar curves are indicated right now. There's a lot of published, this technique started 10 years ago. Uh, it's getting better and better with the, because we know more and we have a, we, we have a learning curve, so like any techniques you use. So this is the way we prepare the patient in the OR. Um, we go anteriorly to the spine, mark the levels, and then with a minimum invasive uh, um, incision, you can do the whole surgery. Um, this is the way we put the screws on the cord. This is a video of how we do the pedigar, which is by cortical purchase of the screws. Here is also a video how we put the, uh, the staples and then the, put the screws. As you see, it's a minimum invasive incision. We open with a nasal cannula and then we put the portal. After the portal, we put the uh, staple. Um, so it's a very nice technique. That's the way we put the staples. So we're checking everything. We're checking the acicus vein, the lungs. And I say cemental, so it's the part that we're removing with the uh, with some, uh, retractor there, so we can put the staple in a better position. And then we take it out, we check it in the, uh, in the uh, fluoroscopy, even though I'm navigating it now, and then we put the screw in. It's a sequential compression, this, and uh, we compress from top to bottom, and then we push the spine down, and we go and start uh, locking the caps all the way down to the uh, lower levels. Uh, there are some cases here I'm gonna show. Um, this is a seven degree uh, immature patient. And uh, we got a 216. Uh, she's doing very well after three years. This is a two months follow-up from the SR scores, very, very good mean average. This is another case. Uh, she was a mature patient, but he had a double curve and the lower back, uh, lower curve, the rack lumbar was 44. So instead of doing a fusion all the way to L3, 4, we decided to do this technique. Uh, this is the correction we got. So we did the parallel to the floor, the L4, 5. And this is what she's doing in the video at three months. In the picture, um, she's uh, a year after surgery. Um, doing this kind of things that I don't think with the fusion you can do it. This is another immature patient. We got good corrections in the three planes. This is how she looks at 20 months follow up. This is another one with a big curve but very flexible. This is very important. If you have a flexible curve, you can do this technique. If you don't have a flexible curve, don't try to do it because it's not going to work. And this is the flexibility of the curve, as you see there. And we got a nice correction. I think she's three years follow, even though my XRS questionnaires are not three years. But uh, this is the video at three months. She's still dancing. This is another one, even though she's mature, you see that 58 degree track lumbar curve. Um, that uh, in the gold standard, we had to go down below the L3 level that will make this degeneration faster when they get older. So they're gonna need a second surgery. So we decided to do this technique. We have very good correction in both uh, planes. As you see there, this is a three year follow-up and the core having break, even though we have a 5% breakage and 3% reoperation rate in this patient. And she sent me this video at three months follow-up. And this is another video of another patient, this one swimming. So as you see, uh, there's a lot of um, 
patients that send videos. I, I've been doing fusions for more than 20 years and my fusions, even though I have a good correction, they don't send me these videos of people dancing, swimming and jumping. Uh, this is one of the complications that can happen. The core can break. It breaks uh, around five to 10% of the time and you have to revise it. Um, this is a revision that we did here. This is the correction we got after the revision. Much better uh, um, cytoplane after the revision than the first surgery. And this is her dancing at three weeks post-op. So it's, you know, um, people really do uh, a lot of things after this. The only problem is the breakage. Uh, one of my uh, indications is early onset cases because they don't grow that fast. So uh, the complication rate of the gold standard right now is the like, uh, growing rods, the magnetic rods, who had a complication rate of more than 20%. So I think this is a good technique because uh, they give you quality of life. Patients know they're gonna need a second surgery, like a growing rod, but at least we have the posterior spine completely virgin. We are not gonna touch it only anteriorly. And they can live three or four years with quality of life until they, they get the definitely fusions at the end. So uh, it's another way to indicate it. Instead of doing um, a growing rod technique, you use a uh, uh, tethering technique. And as you see, uh, at the 10 days, post office is 21 degrees and six months she started growth modulating um, nicely. So that curve is gonna get better. Uh, I hope uh, we can get it to 11, 12 years old before breakage and do the definite surgery. And this is her jumping in two weeks post op. She was very happy. This, this is a video, I'm sorry. A video of uh, one of our patients that uh, it's five months, she got um, second place in this uh, Beyond the Stars um, dancing. And she always sent it to me. I always like to show how much you can rotate, bend, and move when you have a tethering instead of a fusion. Um, so I think it, this is a great improvement for quality of life uh, from patients. So. Uh, it's a good way to understand it better when you see somebody doing this stuff. But sometimes you have uh, curves like this who are not indicated for a tether. You don't have any other way to fix it, only with a fusion. And uh, she's happy, but she's not doing what she was doing before with gymnastic. Even though she's very happy with the surgery, uh, her quality of life didn't improve that much because she cannot do what she likes. But in these cases, the curves are so big that you don't have any choices that uh, only to do it. And these are the pictures post up at three years, she's doing good. But as she, I told you, uh, she didn't send me a video running and jumping. And this is a nice comparison we did here in NYU, um, seeing how um, the, the L4-5 tilt is very important in all these scoliosis cases, because if you have a tilt more than 16 degrees, you know that the, this is gonna degenerate but in these cases, we find out that with the, <laughs> with the tether compared to the fusion, uh, the tilt was better. And where do we go from here? We need to do a lot of uh, long-term outcomes, more research in movement, technique it had to be better, the core had to be better, and uh, we need to find more about patient and family perspectives, risks and benefits, and we have to continue to do data collection, registries and complication rates to see uh, uh, to improve the technique and to see if this really better than what the gold standard is. I think I'm finished with, thank you so much. Okay, great. Thank you, JC. That was an excellent talk and a, and a really great, great demonstration of some of the innovations and cutting edge technology we're doing here at, at NYU in orthopedic spine surgery. Up next, we have Dr. Kolowal Jegede. He's gonna talk about MIS inner body navigation is it a neat trick or a necessary tool. While that's loading up, I just wanna remind everyone to send me your questions um, and I can filter them and, and uh, we'll save them for the end. Unless it's really uh, pertinent to the talk, then we can go over at the time. All right, everyone. Uh, thank you, Dr. Fisher, for the introduction, and Dr. Rodriguez. 
uh, for that great talk. So I'm talking today about uh, inner body navigation, neat trick or necessary tool, nothing to disclose um, associated with this topic. So um, it's a brief outline of my talk. We'll give some background. We'll talk about MIS spine surgery and uh, the drivers for this. Uh, we'll go over navigation robotics and the uh, slow adoption that occurred uh, in an in the field of spine surgery with this. We'll talk about improvements with the current robot uh, assisted navigation systems and then try to give you the answer to the question. Uh, is it a neat trick or um, if it's uh, a neat trick or not? Okay, so let's keep going. So there's been a significant evolution in spine surgery that occurred uh, over the last decade with implants, designs, intrap imaging, and of course, uh, robotic uh, navigation. So the catalysts for these uh, advances include the demand for less muscle dissection, for smaller incisions, for um, faster recovery while achieving surgical goals, goals, which include adequate decompression, adequate fixation, um, and restoring alignment when uh, needed. So enable, enabling technologies are defined as innovations that can drive uh, radical change in the capabilities of the users or the culture of that user. And so the innovations associated with robotic navigation come from the attempt to solve the problems um, that we see in spine pathology and that the spine pathology confront us with. And so we can see that the um, the problems don't change. In the picture on the far left, we see an image out of core from 1981 describing a technique to uh, keep the soft tissue envelope and damage control orthopedics. And then to the far right, we see a uh, an advanced robot system that has the ability to do the same thing, but uh, achieve the goals in a more elegant way. So, um, Intraoperative navigation was um, first reported on in 1995, and we can see the two kind of papers that um, brought us uh, brought us there. So the paper to the left is a cadaveric study um, looking at uh, placement of pedicle screws using um, a stereotactic camera, and this uh, came from literature out of neurosurgery. Um, in the 1980s, and then later that year, there was a clinical study published. Um, looking at 30 patients, um, they used a pre-op CT scan and again, the uh, stereotactic, um, uh, stereotactic uh, information that they uh, used prior to help. And what they found in, early, in these early cadaver studies and in vivo studies were promising results in the terms of accuracy um, compared to standard fluoroscopy and also um, yeah, um, freehand navigation. All right, so what is robot assisted navigation? Um, there are three types of uh, surgical robots. So there's shear control, and that's what we see in most of our spine robots where they're, um, the robot and the, the surgeon have input, there's telesurgical uh, control, and this is occurring when the uh, surgeon is away from that robot system, but can still, um, just still performs the surgery and then there's uh, supervisory control where they're away from the um, the robot but they can uh, the robot performs the surgery but the uh, surgeon has the ability to to make uh, adjustments and so most of the spine uh, robotics uh, come in the uh, first one that we discussed which is a shared control so um, with this great technology, we saw a very slow adoption. So this is a, um, a survey study um, from 2011 looking at um, spine surgeons, and we see that greater than 75% uh, of them uh, at this point, um, even though the first uh, robotic um, FDA robot was approved in 2004, we saw slow, t slow adoption to navigation and robotics in general. This is another um, study occurring uh, later on, um, similar, very low, um, a very low user rate among surgeons. And so let's look at why this is occurring, or why this occurred. And so this is a, a, a um, database study um, from Yang et al. It was published in Spine, just looking at the increased usage of robot-assisted technology. And this 
um, there was a significant peak that occurred um, from the year 2011 to 2016. And we'll go through some of the literature to see um, why this occurred. So navigation, um, we started to see improvement in the types of studies that were available. So this is a clinical study looking at um, a single uh, center of randomized control, looking at the accuracy of robotic versus um, fluoroscopy. So we see that there are, there's improved accuracy, there's reduction in uh, radiation, um, and also reduced length of stay to the patients. It's a similar, uh, but a retrospective study looking at the accuracy, um, revision rates lower using robotic navigation and also the radiation and length of stay um, down in robot-assisted fusions. And so with um, the, the advent of this technology, um, we eventually got to the point where the literature reflected that using robotic um, robotic navigation increased the accuracy of pedicle screws. And that brings us up to the point where um, we're looking at if using navigation for antibodies is worthwhile. And so um, as the learning curve, and which Dr. Goldstein will talk a little bit more about, um, as you catch up with your learning curve, um, people have stretched, and particularly here at this institution, uh, stretched the use of robotics to navigate antibodies as well. So, Robotic navigation gives us the opportunity to do minimally invasive T lifts. It also gives us a, the opportunity to explore single uh, position uh, lateral surgery, um, whether it be doing an A lift and multiple laterals. And it also um, helped decrease the learning curve of single position um, prone lateral surgery. So why do you use technology to place uh, inner bodies? So we'll focus on MIST lifts for this uh, moment. So there's multiple aspects when you think about um, performing a T lift. So um, there's a significant amount of literature looking at open and MIST lifts, and that um, puts us in a good position into evaluating the role of robotic um, or navigated uh, inner bodies in general. And so the potential to help us with disk space preparation, we know that um, there is at least uh, equipost when doing MIST lift if um, compared to open if the technique is appropriate. Um, cage placement, so in taking care of patients who are who have more um, more risk factors such as osteoporosis or um, um, risk factors to not heal, including diabetes smokers, the placement of the, the cage can be um, significantly uh, paramount to the, the patient's outcome. And so that can be helped. And obviously we saw that radiation exposure is decreased, um, particularly to the, the team in the operating room. Um, and then we'll, we'll also talk about time added by navigation or navigating uh, the inner body. And so what do we see with this press disc Space prep, we, we discussed that um, we have at least um, the ability to do as good of a disc prep um, with MIST lift. Um, and using the navigation, we can use literature that we learned from, from doing fluoroscopy based MIST lift to see where we do a bad job. And that usually is in the uh, contralateral, um, posterior lateral side. And so um, using our robotic um, uh, inner body navigation, we can focus on that area to help increase um, our disk space prep and also um, improve our fusion rates with that as well. So uh, this is just a quick video of um, preparing that contralateral postlateral space. So uh, navigation, as I said, helps us um, with cage placement. So this is a patient, 64-year-old uh, woman with uh, multi-level degenerative spondy L45 grade 2 and then a 1 uh, grade 1 at 3-4 and also a degen spondy. And um, you can see this was a uh, navigated case and we had excellent restoration of her uh, lordosis and also um, minimum, um, we don't see any subsidence or um, the cage getting into the plate, uh, into the end place. And I think that that is a upside of, of navigating the cages, particularly in patients who are at risk. All right. So talk about time added by navigation. And um, most of the literature supports that. This, um, and Dr. Goldstein will go over learning curve, but in the learning curve and 
Um, we see increased operative time, although we do see decreased radiation um, and decreased um, pain scores in the patients uh, up front. There is ways where navigation does help decrease time, and this is in single position surgeries. Um, single position surgeries was around prior to the uh, the full advent or full adoption of um, robotic navigation, but with robotic uh, navigation has been made um, more facile and more efficient. And the um, time saving and money saving costs have been frequently published in the literature. You can see this retrospective study looking at uh, 10 patients in the single position, um, um, single position versus 10 patients in the dual position. Um, and so significant shorter surgical time uh, with with the single position and navigation being helping out in these cases as well. Similar uh, things in this retrospective review as well. And <clears throat> study from uh, coming out of our institution looking at uh, single position. So we saw high rates of postoperative ileus and return to the OR for irrigation in the flip, um, shorter length of stay in the patients with single position and um, uh, less blood loss as well. So time saving and um, efficiency in, in decreasing, decreasing uh, the potential for uh, complications postoperatively. And again, um, so using robotics and antibodies and antibodies at the same time, I think has helped advance the learning curve, particularly for surgeries such as prone laterals where the uh, psoas anatomy can be altered because of the position that the patient's in. So in conclusion, um, we see that the problems haven't changed, but our ability and our tools to fix the problems have. And um, with these tools, I think that we're gonna be providing more accurate placement of our cages, um, do more, uh, more efficient um, disc preps and having less cage subsidence. So I don't think it's a neat trick but something that's going to be here to stay. Thanks. Thank you, Dr. Jagade. That was excellent. And um, up next, we have Dr. Pro Saltis. He's going to review optimal use of robotics and navigation assistance in adult spinal deformity. Thank you, Sharla. Just going to wait until uh, the slides get shown here. All righty. So I'll be discussing uh, robotics and navigation use specifically in adult spinal deformity surgery. Um, so as an overview, um, I'm going to touch base on the benefits. I think Undeniably, in unusual anatomy where there can be rotational deformities, accuracy of screw placement is critical. Um, and then there's the potential for less radiation for surgeons and the patient, both. Um, more preoperative planning is always a better thing. And I think planning out a deformity case um, using a robotic or navigation platform ahead of time is really helpful. And even taking the moment to kind of assess where your screws are going to go is critical. Drawbacks, um, operative time potentially, especially in the beginning. And as you're going through the learning curve, that's definitely a concern. And there's a uh, need to adjust usual techniques and workflows. You have to be somewhat flexible when you're adopting a new technology to understand how that technology is going to work best in your hands and safest for the patient. And that sometimes means changing the way you might, the order of the way that you might do things. Like don't disrupt the anatomy too much by doing laminectomies before you do some kind of registration uh, to put in screws, for example. And then you have to have a plan for when things go wrong. Is there, is there a salvage? Can you still stick to the, the current navigation? Can you re-register? Does the platform have those kinds of options? Is there an option to, to revert to something like a two-dimensional fluoroscopic type navigation? These are ways that you can salvage what you're doing and not have to delay and waste time. And in terms of safety, you have to anticipate and plan for changes in workflow. And I think um, that that's critical and, and improved speed of use. Uh, my take on that is, and what I teach my fellows is that you want to introduce things gradually. So you don't have to, like, if you're someone that relies on fluoroscopy, you don't have to fluoroscopy every single part of the case, including, you know, 
doing a laminectomy, for example, and, and that sort of thing. There are lots of, the, lots of parts of the case that you can do without it. Um, and so you can use navigation and robotics as a tool as well and not necessarily put every single implant in with the robot um, and uh, use it as a reference or as a fluoroscopy type um, uh, assistive device. And this is the crux of why I chose navigation and robotics um, in my, my practice now. And I've, I have transitioned uh, in the first 10 years of my practice. I was an all freehand, no, no navigation, no robotics uh, surgeon. Um, and I did a lot of my deformities open. Um, I really dabbled very sparingly with um, MIS type deformity corrections. Um, but now with robotics and navigation, I have the tools that I might need. And, and in general, I, I view this as a safety tool. So I, I, I think uh, you can check the, the tracks of screws that you place freehand. And I think that's helpful uh, for resident and fellow education. You can have interactive 3D anatomy um, at any moment. Um, that's more useful than a CT that you can put up on a screen. Uh, and I think there's certainly accuracy of screw placement. There are fewer missed screws, fewer lateral screws. Not that um, I had a lot of patients that had to go back to the OR to revise screws, but there were the occasional one. And that's where you really see the benefit and in lower reoperation rates. And a lot of the studies have borne that out. Um, I think it's less stressful to do the screw placement now, uh, particularly in percutaneous cases. That's certainly, it was a lot more stressful. And I, I felt the need to really be on top of every single screw that went in. Now I can sit back and let, let a fellow, let even a medical student put in screws while I watch and I can see when something's going wrong and step in and, and correct it. And I think it's less of a physical toll uh, because of uh, robotic targeting um, end effectors, even with awkward positions like lateral screw placement, um, putting in posterior pedicle screws in the lateral position. It's a lot easier ergonomics and I'm not wearing lead. So I put my lead in the closet and it stays there. I don't really feel the need to put it on because and now I've also adopted inner body with navigation, uh, and that's been great. Uh, I think there are great opportunities for single position surgery to do laterals in the prone position, um, do screws in the lateral position while you also do a lifts and laterals. Um, so I think those are great. And for deformity applications, like we talked about rotational deformities, iliac screws are great with robotics doing MIS deformities and putting in perk screws and navigated, uh, laterals are, are great. And then in open cases, um, I like to perk UIV, uh, the, the top screws to prevent PJK. Um, radiation reduction, Cole touched on this. Here's a study from our center. And if you look at the radiation dose, comparing the second column from the left, navigation to robotics to open and MIS, which are percutaneously placed fluoroscopy screws, the fluoroscopy based screws were twice the radiation of navigation and robotics. No, no one can really beat open if you're freehanding everything and you're just checking with some fluoros at the end, but um, it is a significant reduction in, in uh, radiation. Um, and then uh, that also uh, was true for total radiation, which accounted for whether or not the patients got preoperative CTs. The MIS um, uh, utilized screws were still more radiation than getting a preoperative CT, believe it or not. And what, what's at stake for the surgeon is you don't want to end up like um, these 31 physicians who are proceduralists who had GBMs on the side of their handedness, uh, like interventional cardiologists and electrophysiologists standing next to a beam, they all got GBMs on the side of the radiation exposure um, as opposed to the general population where it's pretty equal left versus right side of the brain. So um, there's a lot at stake for your own health um, in, in adopting navigation robotics can minimize that, that risk. Precision of implant placement, meta-analyses that show that navigated pedicle screws are super accurate. You're going to avoid medial breaches, lateral breaches, poor pedicle screw placements. You're basically putting the pedicle screw exactly where you could imagine it would be the best place for it. And that also takes into account lining up your screws to, to make rod passage more easy. Um, another meta-analysis showing that with robotics. Um, so I think screw accuracy is critical. Um, imagine a case like this congenital anomalies, osteoporotic patient with a spinal deformity, that's a nightmare. And, and unfortunately, I had to do this case before the advent of robotics and navigation in my practice. And so I had to tackle this um, with my freehand techniques, uh, but it was a lot more stressful than it probably could have been if I had the tool of uh, an assistive navigation or robotic uh, navigation device. Sacral pelvic fixation is great. 
Um, putting in iliac screws, you can place them percutaneously in a perk case, put them right next to where those S1 screws are so that there is no fiddling around to try to get um, an awkwardly angled iliac screw to meet the tulip of, uh, you know, the rod to the tulip. And um, here are some studies that show that they're super accurate um, from Larry Lenke and Ron Lehman's group. Um, here's a study on the left uh, looking at um, the 100 screws placed by the senior surgeon um, in deformity correction. He had 5% screws with moderate to severe cortical breaches. Um, whereas on the right, robotically placed S2 AI screws, in a, granted a fewer number of uh, screws, um, excellent accuracy in placing. So you can imagine uh, if your registration is accurate, you're going to put that screw exactly where it needs to be. And I think there's great opportunities for single position surgery. Cole touched on this. I think there's advantages. You are putting in more inner bodies from anterior and lateral approaches. So you get access to more part, a larger surface area of the disc for fusion. Uh, theoretically, you can put bigger cages in. You're taking down the ALL. You should be able to restore alignment better uh, with this tool. Um you have simultaneous anterior and posterior access. There's no repositioning. And in a study that Cole alluded to, our operative time uh, was 110 minutes, almost two hours less in the single position group. And it, it's not just that we have slow repositioners at our institution and everyone's moving at slow pace when it's time to, to change the patient position. It's also that you're opening and closing simultaneously different accesses to the patient's spine, front, back, side, uh, and you're closing those wounds at the same time you're prepping one time. So there's undeniably uh, a better um, workflow, and uh, there was no difference in radio, radiologic alignment uh, in lateral position patients versus prone. Um, so imagine a case like this. Uh, when I saw this case, the first thing I thought, I had navigation and robotics as a tool. I said, this is a great case to do some minimally invasive lateral inner bodies and anterior inner bodies, followed by percutaneous screws, and that's how I chose to tackle it in one position with the vascular surgeon in the front, me in the back, putting in the screws. And then when the time came uh, to switch to the front, do the the uh, the laterals and the anterior inner bodies. And you can see the team working simultaneously, front, back, side, um, getting a nice correction in the patient through with percutaneous incisions and a, an excellent result uh, for the patient um, with a short length of stay. And in times of COVID, last thing you need is to send a patient to the ICU. Uh, hopefully that's all behind us now, but uh, also a consideration for us um, in the last few years. Um, and then there's also the potential for lateral single position prone cases. So patient, placing the patient in one position prone and then firing in some laterals, potentially even taking down the ALL um, as you do it. Uh, and there's no repositioning. There's no back, front, back, or well, you can actually do back, front, back, but it's a, the patient in one position. You can alternate between going in the front, going in the side, and going in the back. Um, in prone position, you can add the lateral to the posterior at the same time, um, and that could be advantageous. And so I've I've revised T lifts in this way. I've I've revised. Um, um, deformity corrections that didn't go right in this way and adding inner bodies to pseudos that, and adding correction uh, with the position, patient position in the way that I'm going to optimize lordosis. So I think that th this is a great technique for revision. If you're just extending up and you want to add uh, a lateral inner body, it's great. You expose the hardware, you can perk the UIV screws and then get your inner body in that same position. Um, if you need extensive posterior decompression, it's also great. If you want to do a two, three level laminectomy and you think this isn't great for doing uh, tubular decompression, it's also great. Um, so I think th there's lots of uh, advantages. I like to build up one side. This makes anesthesia less um, nervous. It also allows me to, to put the anterior retractor blade after I put the lateral retractor in and not have to fight with the Jackson cradle. Um, but definitely you have to tape the patient. Um, you can see all the tape here. Some people will try to add a moment arm to the greater trochanter to kind of open up the space the way that they might break the bed. Um, but I don't find that that's particularly reliable or that it changes the patient position. But sometimes adding a little foam on the other side as a, as a bumper can help with that. Um, you can see you can secure the head, the chest, the pelvis, and the legs so that you tilt the patient and they're not going to fall off the bed. 
if you can get that build up on one side and have at least like say eight to nine degrees of tilt built into how you position the patient, then adding another couple of degrees is going to make the difference. And what I found is about 25 degrees is the, is the optimal number so that you're not crouching your head. Um, and, and I think, uh, you, you know, navigation really takes the stress out um, of putting in the screws, putting in and doing navigated laterals. And if you're in an awkward position, uh, it's great uh, because you can see exactly what you're doing. I'm navigating um, the positioning within the psoas. So I try to penetrate the psoas more ventral and then drag it back and then get the, uh, the guide wire in the perfect spot uh, for the shim placement. So it's behind the cage. Um, so that's stuff that I do on the navigation screen. Whereas before I was just blindly poking through the psoas and hoping that I wasn't any, near any nerves. So here's a case, um, a woman that had a PSO, but you can see it was a, she's osteoporotic and it just kind of collapsed in parallel and there wasn't any lordosis correction whatsoever. Uh, so she needed a, 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 a revision and she had a pseudo around her PSO with no bridging bone. There was no inner bodies that were placed. Uh, it wasn't a grade four, it was a grade three. And uh, there was no posterior bridging bone. So she had L2, 3 and L3, 4 pseudos. And um, I chose to tackle this prone. Uh, you can see uh, I've exposed the hardware, took the rods out. Now I dropped the, the retractor in. I'm getting into the disc spaces. And I did two prone laterals taking down the ALL. Um, these are, and these happen to be expandable cages um, that, that release the ALL and expand that segment, getting a lot of lordosis. And then the only thing left to do in the back was drop the rods. Uh, this case started at eight o'clock, done by 11 o'clock and um, handing her over to a plastic surgeon to do the posterior wound closure and, and a very nice uh, correction with a minimally invasive technique. Um, drawbacks. Um, longer OR times, especially in the beginning as you're going through your learning curve. And so I, I recommend just kind of introducing it a little bit at a time. And, and if things get bogged down, feel, don't feel the need to, to keep going with it if, if you're spinning your wheels. Um, and always try to do uh, the screws right after your registration. If that means you're going to do an introp spin, you could do a whole bunch of stuff to the spine in that case, and then do your spin. And then first thing you do is drop your screws. If you're using a preoperative CT workflow where you shoot fluoros and your system has the capability of merging after that, then what you do is um, you, you take those x-rays before you disrupt the anatomy. You put your screws in right away. If the system has a headless screw, it's great. If not, just drill the screw to tract and don't put the screw in until you need to do the work that you need to do at that level around T-lifting or laminectomizing or whatever you need to do. Uh, and those are great uh, ways to minimize uh, things going wrong. But if they do go wrong, you need a bailout plan. Um, always check to make sure that your accuracy is good. If you've got screws that were placed right after registration, they're going to be accurate. So if you're going to then do an inner body at a level, you can check the screw right below that inner body space and see if the screw is accurate. And you can gauge how much deviation there might be caudal sent uh, to the right, to the left, um, et cetera. And if it's still accurate within a few millimeters, Doing an inner body doesn't need uh, three millimeter accuracy. Um, so you can still proceed because a lot of that, that procedure is done with feel, not with, with absolute accuracy. And always work farthest to closest to the array. So if you're doing multi-level inner bodies, you work farthest. So more cephalad levels down to towards the array, which is usually placed at the bottom of the wound or at the PSIS. Um, and always leave the forceful parts for last. So in conclusion, I think there's several great applications in spine surgery and in deformity in particular. I think it's amazing for, for perking screws. And if you've got an MIS uh, deformity case that you want to tackle, it's amazing for that. It's amazing for doing S2 or iliac screws because you're just taking away the chance that you're going to skive because you've got the end effector, you've got a burr, you've got a nice drill. Uh, there's lots of tools for keeping you on track and putting you right in the fat part of the ilium. Uh, with your screws. And, uh, and I think they're definitely explore less radiation for you, the staff, and potentially the patient. If you're, if you're not going to put the lead on and try to fluoroscopically place screws, that's a lot of radiation for everyone. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Prosaltis. That was great. That was a really good review of using uh, robotics and navigation in adult spinal deformity. Okay, so we've gone through scoliosis, new techniques. 
We've gone through MIS inner body navigation. We've gone through new technology using adult spinal deformity. So now we're all ready to get started. And Jeff Goldstein's gonna tell us how to get through the learning curve swiftly and safely. Great, thanks Dr. Fisher. And uh, those are all great talks. So I'm happy to be invited to participate in this uh, webinar. Uh, my pertinent disclosures are that I do have a relationship with Globus who's a robot and instrumentation I've been using. I think with regard to safety and my use of robotics, it's probably helpful to understand what my practice is. You know, Dr. Uh, Protosaltis is a, has a large deformity practice. My practice is predominantly degenerative. Although um, I do do some, some deformity, it's pro predominantly related to instability and spinal elastesis. And, you know, the old joke is all the deformity that I create. Uh, NYU is an urban academic uh, medical center and I uh, do decompression such as microdiscectomies, anterior posterior surgery, T lifts, laterals, and uh, posterior spinal fusions, as well as uh, cervical and uh, lumbar artificial disc replacements and both open and MIS uh, procedures. So it was a transition for me to go to from open surgery to uh, robotic or percutaneous surgery. I, we are well, we're all well trained in, or, in open surgery, um, feel very safe and comfortable doing it, but uh, occasionally you do have a misplaced uh, screw. Um, in my practice, I've uh, transitioned to using posterior fixation as a supplement to an inner body, um, whether it's through an anterior, lateral, or posterior procedure. And we used to supplement our fixation, uh, which worked quite frank, uh, which worked very well, quite frankly, with translaminar facet screws. So my goal in doing most of my operations <clears throat> using an inner body is to avoid uh, stripping the transverse processes, get as big as an inner body uh, that I can. And uh, I was using percutaneous screws. So I never really had an appreciation of how the robot would fit into my practice. The, um, I used a sextant, which was probably the first, if not, uh, which was not, if not the first, was certainly one of the earlier percutaneous pedicle screw systems. <clears throat> And, um, and one of the problems with that is that it has a lot of radiation. We're able to do, uh, as I mentioned, uh, anterior and posterior procedures through uh, small incisions with less muscle stripping. Uh, but what about, um, you know, the problem with it was a radiation exposure. You know, radiation exposure, not just to the patient and the staff, but also to the surgeon. Uh, as Dr. Protosaltis showed sooner, there's, you know, more than one uh, practitioner that uses radiation are in their operations who've developed uh, sarcomas or other uh, malignancies. Uh, so my goal for robotics or my interest in robotics is, A, can I improve my accuracy? Because even with a, a percutaneously placed screw, um, occasionally you have a, a patient that's difficult to image by their body, secondary their body habit is. Um, I wanted something that I can, was uh, consistent and I want to, can you improve operative times? <clears throat> is it cheaper? And is it a less invasive approach? By that, I mean less blood loss, less tissue damage, shorter recovery, shorter hospital stays, and less chronic pain. But overall, it needs to be, uh, it needs to be safe and accurate. So my initial hesitations were related to cost. A robot, as, you're, as you know, is not a cheap device. And will it be better than my present procedure? And also, is a robot as smart as it thinks it is? You know, it's important to have good registration when you, um, when you set up your robot. And what can go wrong, especially when we started, the, uh, we probably we had less of an idea of what can go wrong. The robots are smarter now than they were when we started. The uh, surgeons are smarter now than when we started. Now, when I initially started, my reps experience was probably just a few months longer than mine. So in uh, image, an image guided computer assisted navigation, we use intraoperative CT, uh, you navigate the instruments and you manually identify the start points and trajectories. The benefit of a, robot, uh, of a robot that has navigation is that you can use either preoperative CT or intraoperative fluoro and CT. And it's a shared system, as Dr. Jagedy mentioned earlier in his talk. And it, you can use a preoperative plan uh, to uh, help guide the surgeon to the starting point and trajectory. So the robot in, um, in spine surgery never touches the patient like the um, da Vinci robot does in general surgery, but really serves as a guide. The, um, you know, one of the most important things is safety. I always show this, this picture of my son when he was seven. It's not, it's, it's like driving a Tesla or playing a video game. 
The only, you know, the most important part is that we're not playing a video game. We're not driving a car. We have a patient that, at the end. So this is not child's play. And we have to make sure that it's, uh, that it's safe and accurate. So um, we did a study of our learning curve. And um, the, uh, Dr. Deep D. Jane, who uh, was one of my previous fellows, who's now at WashU, is a lead author on this study. And uh, so we evaluated a single um, institution experience using robotic uh, uh, guidance for placement of our pedicle screws. And um, the purpose was to describe the safety and efficacy of um, the uh, Globus robot, which is a robot that we um, uh, were evaluating, the first robot we had. The, uh, it's a retrospective case series looking at consecutive patients. And these are patients that underwent thoracolumbar posterior spinal fusion um, that um, were utilized with robotic assistance. And we looked at charts, we looked at success of screw placement and uh, perioperative screw related complications. There were a subgroup of patients that were able to evaluate postoperative CT scans, and we graded the um, pedicle screw accuracy placement by the Gertzbein and Robbins cl classification, and we considered uh, groups A and B to be acceptable. This is a um, uh, this study show. Excuse me. This slide shows the preoperative planning on the uh, on the Globus robot, and uh, shows how you can place your screws preoperatively um, to map out where you want them to be intraoperatively. I use preoperative CT images, but um, you can also use intraoperative flor fluoro and also uh, intraoperative spin. This, uh, this just shows the intraoperative fluoro, fluoro showing, excuse me, an intraoperative procedure, excuse me, intraoperative picture showing the placement of the screw through the robotic arm. And uh, the screw is being placed by the, uh, to match the overlying CT. Um, we talked about single position laterals. This is one of uh, the cases we did probably in the first month that we had the procedure where we completed a lateral lumbar interbody fusion and uh, then did a single position uh, screw placement. Um, in, my, in my opinion, the, um, this is a terrific procedure. Um, I, like, I don't like to do it in patients who need big uh, decompressions, but if you need to do a uh, percutaneous screw placement as a supplement to a lateral interbody, it uh, works really well. So we had 106 patients. We placed um, uh, 636 pedicle screws, six iliac screws, and one S2AI screw. Um, the, um, these were all supplements to an inner body, uh, either a lift, lateral lumbar, inner body fusion, or a, a T-lift. Most important part is um, at the bottom two numbers. We had zero screw complications and zero patients returned to the OR. So there's um, a demonstration in our learning curve of patient uh, safety and uh, accuracy. So all screws that were not placed by the robot, we did use a, uh, a fluoro percutaneous uh, backup. <clears throat> and I mentioned about uh, lateral lumbar inner body fusion in our first uh, group of patients, we had uh, four of the 12 lateral lumbar inner body fusions were performed in a single position. And uh, all uh, A-lifts in lateral uh, fusions were performed prior to screw, uh, screw placement. <clears throat> so we had 66 screws um, in 13 patients who had preoperative CT scans. 63 of the screws were graded as GERTS band A, four screws graded at B, which was 100% um, acceptable screw placement, meaning there were no GERTS band Cs. So as far as uh, safety in our learning curve, navigation robotics were uh, uh, very successful, 100% successful in placing our screws placement. And um, the learning curve uh, was not as difficult as we thought it would be. So looking at a, a case, and I know Dr. Fisher has some other cases, this is, this is one of our early cases, a patient with a degenerative uh, spondy at four or five with motion on flexion extension views. You can see the facet joints are uh, incompetent. And uh, this is a patient who underwent a, a T-lift and, uh, and pedicle screw placement. The patient had some trochanteric bursitis. So uh, in the hospital, we did get a, a CAT scan and you can see the screws uh, were placed uh, appropriately. Um, one month postoperative, the leg pain resolved and they were doing well. And um, you know, we obviously have longer term uh, follow-up. Yeah, as far as safety, uh, safety uh, goes with, um, robotic, with robotic applications, 
anytime I think you have the opportunity to stay out of the canal with a direct decompression uh, is another opportunity to improve patient safety. So um, we've been using more and more indirect decompression. I don't think that we have a uh, handle on exactly which patients are the best for it, but um, with an indirect decompression in a patient who has stenosis, if you can open up the foramen and the leg pain goes away, uh, obviously that's a, uh, an opportunity not to be in the canal. We've seen benefits of this even in high-grade uh, stenosis. Um, and these are patients that um, we can do an inner body um, placement of a device and then uh, robotically placed uh, pedicle screw placed in very safety. So I, when I say an easier operation, I don't want anybody to construe that and say, well, spine's an easy, an easy operation. What I mean by that is it's easier um, in my opinion, with uh, diminished dissection, with uh, less muscle stripping, less blood loss, less labor, and quite frankly, I think it's less stress. It's still a technically demanding operation, so not to say that anything we do is uh, easy. Um, certainly, when you do a single position surgery as opposed to a, a front and back surgery, there's, there's more, more steps and more opportunity to, um, to get into uh, complications or uh, diminish the uh, safety to the patient. So if, you, there are, if there's an opportunity to do it um, in single position, I think that, uh, that there are benefits. The, um, you can see that there's uh, improved surgical times, less time in the operating room, and uh, less blood loss with single position. Um, this is a uh, study that uh, Dr. Jagedy showed uh, earlier that was done by one of our residents. Dem demonstrating with single position surgery, uh, safety is demonstrated with less operative time, less blood loss, less radiation exposure, lower length of stay, and um, less uh, minor complications such as um, ileus. Um, once again, an article showing the uh, benefits of single position surgery. I think it's a safer operation with decreased operative times, lower radiation dosage, shorter length of stay, and fewer postoperative um, complications. I think the last thing I want to touch on is um, uh, increasing patient safety with intraoperative uh, 3D imaging. The, um, we uh, recently expanded our uh, intraoperative 3D imaging. This is the, um, the Globus uh, entry into the uh, market. The benefit about the, what's nice about this is it really uh, works um, well, with the, uh, well with the robot. The, um, instead of having to get an intraoperative CAT scan, you can just get intraoperative imaging without having to, um, uh, you can get intraoperative imaging and then do the planning off of the, uh, off of the uh, 3D spin. But I think uh, in, in my opinion, it's not there yet. I mean, meaning I think that's probably, there's not enough devices and the cost is, uh, it's not cheap, but I think there's an opportunity to uh, get good images after surgery and check the placement of your instrumentation. Uh, with three with a uh, 3D spin, and um, you know, it'd be nice. To, it's nice to leave the operating room with a uh, um, you know with a views 3D views of your spine to see that the screws are well placed. So um, so with the robot, you have diminished uh, radiation in the operating room. You can get preoperative CT or intraoperative uh, laterals. As I mentioned, I previously used sextant. And uh, I think there's diminished radiation exposure to the uh, surgeon and OR. I think I'll stop there and uh, give uh, Dr. Fisher the opportunity to show some cases. All right, great. Well, thank you so much for that excellent talk. Um, and as you can see, the learning curve doesn't have to result in any patient safety issues. Um, so we're gonna go over some cases. And really, these are all patients with back and bilateral leg pain. Um, and so I'm just going to get each of the faculty's thoughts on um, how to treat this. And there's no right answer, just a discussion of different uh, surgical techniques. Uh, so the first case we have, um, this is a patient overall alignment. You can see that there's a little bit of uh, slip forward at four or five on the standing films. And here we can see there's an unstable spondylolisthesis at four or five. And this is the axial cut through that level. 
and uh, I think it scrolls down to a couple uh, cuts here. Here's the lateral um, and uh, other lateral recess. And here's the CT. So in general, we have a spondyl, uh, unstable, slightly unstable spondylolisthesis at four five with some boggy facet joints. Um, Dr. Jagaday, what are your thoughts about how would you treat this um, case? What sort of surgical techniques would you use? Sure. So uh, I guess the kind of the big decision tree is if we think that she can be uh, decompressed indirectly. Um, and I think that she she has moderate to severe lateral recess stenosis, but it is not the worst uh, central stenosis. Um, and her psoas anatomy is um, is appropriate for doing a lateral antibody fusion. So um, I think that this is a woman who could uh, get a four or five single position lateral antibody uh, fusion with perk screws in the back. Okay. And what is it about the psoas anatomy that makes it appropriate for a lateral approach? Yeah, so we can see here, um, our pointer is probably not pointing out, but on this cut at four or five, that her ears are not what we call Mickey Mousing, so it doesn't cause the lumbar plexus to be right in your corridor. Um, and I believe her iliac crest anatomy is also favorable, so that those things can, uh, yeah, so you know, she, she has a relatively low crest. Um, and I don't think doing an all posterior approach or doing the uh, anterior posterior is a bad idea, but um, I think you can keep this woman in one position and uh, get her out of the OR in an efficient manner. Okay, great. Um, okay, thank you for those thoughts. And, and that's how this patient was treated. Um, and so you can see a nice rest restoration of disc height and some lordosis. And um, these are the intra-op films. And these are post-op films at about six months. And then you can see um, uh, post-op films at a year. So she did great. Um, up next, I'm gonna ask Dr. Probsaltis to comment uh, on this case. So this is a patient, um, again, with back and bilateral leg pain prior ACDF. Uh, and you can see, again, another uh, spondylolisthesis at four or five. Um, moving subtly, maybe a little bit on flexion extension films, but not grossly. And if this will play. Okay, so here's the MRI scrolling through. And then next up, this is through the plane of the disk space. Oh, wait, no, that just repeated. Sorry. Next slide. Here we go. This is through the plane of the disk space there. Okay. So what are your initial thoughts about this case? So this one's somewhat similar to the last. There's a, a spondy. It looks unstable. Um, there's a lot of central stenosis, uh, as is the case in many degenerative spondylolisthesis. Um, I get the sense if I had gotten a CT, I'm not sure that a lot of that lateral recess encroachment and central stenosis is be specifically because of calcification of the, um, the ligamentum flavum or excessive osteophytes coming off of the uh, superior articulating process. Those are recipes for failure if you're looking to get an indirect decompression to treat the stenosis. Um, years ago, I would have treated this with an MIS T lift because I, I was loath to do a two position surgery and I wasn't doing a lot of single position surgery. And while doing the single, well, while doing the T lift, I would do a central decompression. I, 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 uh, my, my practice modified from open T lifts to MIS T lifts where I would drop a tube and do the central decompression with a tubular retractor. Um, nowadays I'm, I'm very much in favor of what Cola described, which is the, uh, uh, single position surgery. Um, and I like doing laterals for these cases. This is a, another woman with a low crest. So there's clear access to the disc space. The, the, um, the psoas were not excessively anterior. 
uh, when they are more anterior, then I consider doing a lateral position a lift. Um, if I if I still want to get that nice robust disc prep and restoration of height and indirect decompression, um, but if I do need to do a central decompression, I'll either still do a single position surgery and drop a tube, um, or just uh, consider doing something prone like a T lift again, or maybe even a prone lateral coupled with a central decompression. Um, do you have a CT in this case? I do not. No matter. Um, so I, I would probably proceed with, uh, with doing it that way. We, we do now have intraoperative 3D imaging available as Jeff showed you. And um, I can get that intraoperative 3D spin and, um, and really see if there is lateral research encroachment from osteophytes and calcified ligament and flavum. And then I would make the decision to go ahead and, and potentially drop it too. But I would still probably tackle this case with, with a lateral and followed by um, perk screws in the in the in the lateral position. Okay, great. Um, so that's really good for everyone to hear sort of your thought process on how to do the surgery. Um, this one was done um, an a lift and then uh, central decompression and screws in the back. Um, and she also had a very good outcome, but you can see the progression of options and the progression of techniques. Um, and this one was a little bit older of a surgery, so a little more um, traditional techniques. Um, Jeff Goldstein, can you cover the next case? Sure. Uh, <clears throat> just, just to go over your thoughts. So um, this is another back and bilateral leg pain case. Um, here are the, the standing films. You can see the position of the crest. You can see the amount of slip and amount of disc degeneration. Um, and then these are the flexion extension films. Let's see if I can get this to play. <clears throat> there it goes. So you can see that she had uh, some lateral recess stenosis, but the central stenosis wasn't severe. And I think I need to click. This is going to just scroll through again so you can get, get another look at another sort of feel. And this is going to go uh, through the foramen. Okay, what are your thoughts on this case? I don't have a CT, just the MRI. <clears throat> so the patient has um, lateral recess stenosis, advanced disc space degeneration and collapse and a grade one spondy. They have back and leg pain. So my goal is to decrease both the leg and the back pain. The, uh, the way I would do that is uh, with an inner body. The uh, thoughts about which way I would do the inner body I'm not a big fan of doing um, lateral lumbar surgery at L45. I think the previous case that was done laterally was a good candidate because it was well above the crest. Uh, this one on the on your uh, x-rays, it's below the crest, so it's not one that I would personally do through a lateral. The um, here's the here's the EOS film just so everyone can see where the crest is. Yeah, it looks like it goes right up through the um, it. It looks like the um, crest is at the level of the disc space. So that's not one that I, that I would choose to do <clears throat> laterally. The, um, I want to get disc, disc height uh, distraction. Um, so if I want to get a lot of disc space distraction, I would, in my practice, I would choose an anterior lumbar inner body fusion. Um, I can open up that disc pretty well and reliably open up the, uh, uh, decompress the, the canal, I think, with this lateral recess stenosis. Uh, I don't know that I need to do a, a direct decompression because I would anticipate that this patient's leg pain would get better. So some people might choose to do it through a lateral. I think that's that's fine. I think you could use, quite frankly, a lateral, a T-lift, or an A-lift. I, I would do an A-lift to try to maximize my disc height restoration and then 
uh, percutaneous screws with uh, with a robot. Okay, great. Um, so this one was done with a lateral. It was a bit of a struggle. And sometimes uh, you can take a little bit of the top of that crest off to get in, um, to get the, get the cage in uh, and get your approach. Um, but, the, but all good, you know, all good thoughts about uh, approach and lots of ways of doing this. Um, and I just want to remind our audience to, if you have any questions, particularly as we go over the cases, just go ahead and submit them and then we can go over them um, in a little bit. Uh, and then we have one more case, which I'm going to talk about. Um, so this is another DGEN Spondy uh, and uh, a little bit of instability at 4.5, a lot of disc uh, degeneration. And so the MRI shows a fair amount of bilateral lateral recess stenosis. And then you can scroll, you can see the frame in there. Not super tight um, on that side. Oh, sorry, I gave it away. Um, but so this is a good one where there is some bilateral lateral recess stenosis, a really worn down facet joint um, on the right side and um, particularly digging into that nerve root on the side. And so this might be one that you would wanna do a, a minimally invasive T-lift um, just because if it's particularly one side that the facet joint is really digging into the nerve roots, um, that can really help alleviate and totally de-roof the foramen as the nerve roots exiting and really get good improvement of leg pain. Um, also, you can, do, you can angle your tube or retractor to get a contralateral lateral recess decompression. And so I think in cases where you have lateral recess stenosis, due to facet hypertrophy and overgrowth and thickening of the facet joint, that an MIST lift can be very helpful. You can see that in this case, the, uh, she has some Mickey Mouse ears, meaning the psoas is really anterior. So you're really gonna get a lot of nerve root um, involved, like sort of uh, retraction or irritation from your approach. Um, so this one, uh, she underwent a minimally invasive T-lift with bilateral lateral recess decompression, and she did very well. Okay, great. So we can go over any questions we have. Um, and uh, one question we have for Dr. Rodriguez Oliveri uh, what is the long-term follow-up of the tethering scoliosis surgery? Right now, 10 years. And, uh, and can you speak to the longevity of, of the technique, or are we comparing apples to oranges because the technique was done in a way that's different than the way that you're doing it? No, uh, there, there is a uh, papers about 10 years follow-up, but the 10 years follow-up is really the first five years, six years was on the learning curve and the comparison were bad. So with the new technology, the new systems and uh, better indications, uh, I think the last, this year in the SRS, the abstract so more long is uh, four years, I think. Like four years with, you know, indications better, better technique, and, uh, you know, incre uh, decreasing the learning curve is four years. But the technique is being used for 10 years and there are papers of 10 years. John Brown in um, Boston, I've done it, uh, I think he got a paper for 10 years. Okay, great, thank you. Um, we have another question sort of general. Um, how can one conclusively prove in a specific case that a spondylolisthesis is a pain generator versus an incidental finding? Um, I'll throw that out to the group. Anyone wanna take that? I think it depends on the patient's presenting symptoms, where their leg pain is, um, if their leg pain is in a dermatomal distribution. Um, <laughs> I think a lot of it is what the patient says on history that will allow us again 
Another thing um, is the extent of the compression on the MRI, on the imaging studies. And then usually prior to them getting any surgical treatment, they've had, um, they've had conservative treatment, which can include an injection, um, which can uh, potentially be diagnostic and therapeutic to make sure that, you know, the, what we're seeing there at uh, the L4 Fosfondi is, is actually a, a pain generator. And in most cases in the population, it's not, so. You have to remember that, it, especially in the cases we showed today, the reason these patients are having pain is not because they have a spinal anesthesis necessarily, it's because they have spinal stenosis and nerve compression. The reason, so we're not operating on the patient necessarily because they have a spinal anesthesis as, as their pain generator, it's because they have uh, spinal stenosis, which is the pain generator. And we're doing a fusion because we know that patients do better long-term with an unstable spondy with a uh, spinal fusion. Great. Thanks for that feedback, guys. Um, yeah, I would just echo that these cases were um, all degenerative spinal anesthesis just for comparison of technique and approach. Um, and they all had symptoms and findings that were concordant with uh, central or foraminal stenosis. Um, we have another question. Uh, I have seen studies in which complication rates have been as high as 30% for surgeries whose goal has been to correct sagittal imbalance. Have these approaches decreased the complication rate for these procedures? So I wouldn't, I wouldn't say that uh, on the whole, um, these techniques are going to save you from complications or make them better. And um, I can tell you that there are prospective studies in deformity where the complication rates are over 100% because patients get more than one complication and many of them get complications. Um, and so, you know, the bigger the surgery, the more likelihood there are to accumulate complications. And if you define your complications uh, as everything from UTIs to pseudarthroses and uh, screws that are malplaced and rods that break and pseudarthroses that, that require revision surgery, then um, you're going to get a fairly high amount of complications and deformities. But it's undeniable that when these patients are severely deformed and disabled, that these realignment procedures help them regain their quality of life. And so what I counsel patients about is to expect some amount of complications and usually even with complications, the satisfaction at the end of two years, having resolved a lot of the complications with whatever is necessary to get them to their resolution, there's still that benefit to the patient and the, and the improvement in their quality of life. Thank you so much for that, that answer. That was really informative. We have another question. Um, uh, if someone could speak to the time to healing and restrictions on your MIS single level fusions. So I think uh, time to healing, I think, is a challenging question. So we can take it in terms of um, time to sort of like total recovery time. So they're sort of back to life as well as uh, fusion time and then any restrictions. Yeah, so uh, in I, my pro oh, go ahead, Dr. Jagade. Yeah, so I, I think I definitely agree with what you said in terms of time to fusion. I think patients have different um, genetic factors that we don't fully understand um, yet that causes them to fuse um, earlier than others. And obviously, there are some patient-specific factors that are associated with their past medical history that can cause them to heal later on, such as diabetes or um, being a currently active smoker or or other systemic illnesses. Um, but, you know, I tell patients in the office that it's on a cont continuum. Um, everyone um, deals with pain differently and it's hard to say um, where you are until you wake up. But on average, um, with an MIST lift, um, the surgical pain, the pain is um, significantly decreased two weeks afterwards um, and they're able to get up and walk and um, immediately after surgery and, um, you know, the three month mark is where most people are starting to turn the corner. I agree. I tell patients anywhere from like that two to four week period is where they really sort of um, turn a corner 
the first two weeks are pretty unpleasant, but then they, they really start to take off around two to four weeks. Um, and then as far as restrictions, I do no bending, lifting, or twisting for the first six weeks. And that's really just for, for pain management. Um, these constructs are solid. It's not to protect the screws or implant or inner bodies or anything like that, but just the, the pain and the paraspinal muscles are just engaged and really painful uh, during the first six weeks. Um, and then, yeah, I follow patients for as long as they'll still come see me. And I tell them sometimes the fusion can take up to two years. Um, but that's why we're getting x-rays, uh, every so often and that, um, they're mostly recovered by about three months. So they've done some physical therapy. They're, they're feeling better doing more. Um, so by about, uh, three months at the latest, uh, we have another question. Are EMGs instructive? And I think that's just sort of general for these minimally invasive uh, techniques. Uh, I, I certainly don't get EMGs as a rule in, in cases. Uh, usually the diagnosis is there. And for example, in the case of spinal stenosis, you're not necessarily going to get a disruption in, in EMG and they're not necessarily a, a radicular component to the pain pattern. It could be neurogenic claudication, uh, which isn't going to give you a disturbance in the EMG. So you have to be astute um, and use it as a tool when necessary. And so if you're, if, if the symptoms don't perfectly match, if there's a lot of leg pain, if there's numbness in the wide distribution, if it's stocking or sock glove distribution numbness, you know, and it, it's helpful to know going into surgery that the patient has concurrent neuropathy um, or if the weakness pattern doesn't match uh, with what you see on the MRI, for example, you may want to get an EMG and have the patient see the neurologist because there could be concurrent neurodegenerative conditions uh, that are confounding the picture. So that's what usually when I use EMGs. Great. Thank you. And we have another question. Is there a difference in long-term increase in lower lumbar pain in patients after tether versus fusion for scoliosis? Can you repeat the question again? I didn't hear you. Yeah, yeah. Is there a difference in long-term increase in lower lumbar pain in patients after tether or fusion for scoliosis? Well, yeah, that the follow that follow four-year follow-up uh, abstract is interesting to compare fusions versus uh, tethers, and the uh, the lumbar spine, the more movable, the less you're gonna have pain in the future because the discs degenerate lower. But uh, the, the point is the uh, four five tilt. So if you have a fusion that doesn't correct the four five tilt less than 16 degrees, so you go below L3-4, well, the degeneration of the disc, I think is uh, 22 years, 25 years post fusions. Uh, follow up of four years, we don't have a 10 year, 20 year follow up of tethers, but uh, the idea and the hypothesis is, is you have movement in the spine, the lumbar spine, like a normal spine. And then secondly, the uh, tilt angles below the three, four discs are parallel to the floor. In theory, the degeneration of the disc is gonna be less and the pain in the future is gonna be less too. Okay, great. Well, thank you. Uh, I'll, give, I'll give everyone just a few more minutes if you wanna um, ask any questions. Um, remember, you can go ahead and uh, enter your questions and we can see um, uh, if we have anything else that anyone wants to cover. Otherwise, it's, um, it's been a great hour and a half. I wanna thank our faculty so much for these really informative talks, um, just showing that NYU is on the cutting edge for a lot of techniques. And we continue to strive to provide optimal patient care and really uh, improve outcomes through these techniques. Um, while they are fun for us, it is helping us to improve patient care. So with that, if there are no other questions, we can go ahead and say thank you and adjourn. So have a good night, everyone. Thank you. Great. Bye. Thank you. Thank you.